First Kings chapter three, starting reading our reading at verse sixteen. We'll read through the end of the chapter. First Kings three. Verse 16, later two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and gave, I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were there. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She said she laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not my son. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine and the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, the one says that this is my son that is alive and your son is dead, while the other says, not so, your son is dead and my son is the living one. So the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living boy in two. Then give one half to one and the other half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because compassion for her son burned within her, please, Lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, it shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king responded, give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All of Israel heard the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. Amen. Whose child is this? Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we have come to yet another moment and hour where we seek to hear your voice and to hear a word from you. So God, we ask that you silence any voices within us, God, calm our emotions and all of our thoughts such that we may be able to focus on hearing you. God, speak beyond us and in spite of us, God, that we may always be changed by the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the deep watches of the night, he slept peacefully. He snuggled closer to his mom. Maybe he purred or cooed a little bit as he tried to get closer to the warmth of what he had been used to for nine months in the womb. And all was well for a while until all of a sudden it wasn't. Maybe he cried, or maybe he whimpered, or maybe he didn't get a chance to make a sound at all as he struggled to breathe, his little lungs constricting as far as they could, trying to grasp a breath, but it didn't work. Life left his body, his little body went limp, and he would never know the joys or the sorrows of this world. Whose child is this? King Solomon was the son of David, King David and Bathsheba. And he was known for his wealth, his wisdom, and his writings. And so these two women come before him. And the first woman begins to plead and she says, please. She says, this woman and I live in the same house. She said, and I gave birth on the first, I first gave birth, and then three days later, she gave birth, and we were the only two people there. She's like, but that night, the night that she gave birth, her child died because she laid on top of him. And when she discovered that he had died, she got up in the middle of the night while I was sleeping, and she took her dead son, and she laid him at my bosom. And then he, she took my living son, and she took him and laid him at her bosom. And when I woke up in the morning to feed my son, I noticed that he was dead. But when I looked closer, I realized that it wasn't my child. The other woman begins to speak all of a sudden. No, no, no. The living son is my son and the dead son is your son. No, I know my son. My son lives. Your son is dead. King Solomon 
says in essence, well, both of y'all are saying the same thing. He says, pray me a sword. And he says, divide this child into two pieces. Give one half to this mother and the other half to this one. And the mother, whose son it was, spoke up. She says, no, 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 please, please don't do that. She can have it. Just don't hurt him. The other mother, very cold and ruthless, says, well, hey, if you divide him, either one of us can have him. Go ahead and do it. King Solomon says, no, the first woman is the mother. Return the child to her unharmed. And it says that everyone who heard this recollection feared King Solomon because they acknowledged the wisdom of God in him to administer justice. There are only three things that we know for sure about these women. Three, for sure. One, they were both prostitutes. Two, they lived in the same house. And three, they had both given birth to sons. Everything else is a blur. Now I acknowledge the fact that this passage in its intent is, is to show that King Solomon, you know, is able to justly rule his people in Israel. But I think that there are some other things in this passage between these two women that we can look at today, right, that may serve us to really help understand more about what it means to be a mother. So, the first thing is that what determined whether or not the first woman was the mother of the son was not the truth, nor was it biology, but it was her response, her action in that moment. How do we know that? We know this because there are gaping holes in the first woman's story, right? There's some holes in her story that we can't really get over. Well, I can't really get over it, all right? So we look at the story and we say, oh, it seems pretty simple, but really when you start to think about it, it doesn't. So for example, she says that, you know, when she woke up the next morning, she discovered that her son was dead, but it wasn't actually her son. What mother of a three-day-old infant doesn't have to get up at least once or twice in the night to feed him, but can sleep through the whole night before she gets up to feed him? That's a hole. Something's not right. By her own account, she was asleep. So she didn't see this woman bring a child into her room and switch, right? And third, how did she know that this woman had laid on her son in order for him to die? She was asleep. How does she know he died like that unless maybe she accidentally rolled onto her own son? And her own guilt and denial pushed her to a place that says, I gotta have a living son. How can she know that? So then what about the other woman, right? She was cold and ruthless. And that's not normal, right? But we know today that postpartum depression can be a very cold and ruthless thing. So here we have a woman who could possibly not be healthy, not be whole, right? Because what mother, much less um, toward her own child, but even towards other children, right, would be so ruthless unless something was off balance. I once saw, um, I was watching the Discovery Channel once and there was a mother alligator and she had laid eggs and she discovered the abandoned eggs of a turtle. Right? And what did she do? She nurtured both sets of eggs the same and saw both the turtles and her baby alligators to the water safely when it was time. The predator protected the prey. Why? Because the mother in her superseded, right? The part of her that says, I need to eat these turtles. No. Something was wrong with this woman. It wasn't normal. We know she had a baby. Right? Something was off. So it's not very clear as to whether or not the child that died, right, or the child is living, which one belongs to which mother in terms of biology. So it, the, the holes are just too big for me. I couldn't overlook them. I said, no, something's off with the story. However, the first woman was still deemed the mother of this child. Why? Because of her response. It was how she responded in compassion, right, to the king, to the baby being killed. You see, she was the one willing to give up her rights in order to protect him. She was the one willing to go over and beyond in order to make sure that his life 
was safe. Now, here's where I say that I don't want to undermine what it means to give birth physically. Right? I understand the importance of that and how much a mother's love runs deep when, for the fruit of her womb. Right? But I would like to contend that every woman right, has a call to be a mother. Right? I, would, I would contend that. And this passage proves it because we cannot prove beyond a shadow of a doubt whose child was whose. And neither could King Solomon. There were no DNA tests. He didn't even visit the scene of the crime. Right? He solely went on her response. It was her act of love that made her the mother. Genesis tells us that men and women are created in the image of God. Right? And if we believe that, then we have to believe that God has both masculine and feminine qualities. So if God, right, is neither male nor female, meaning God transcends gender. Gender is a limitation of humanity. Right? So then if I say God is he or God is she, I'm not ascribing maleness to God or femaleness to God. I am simply speaking from a place that says our language is limited in how we can even talk about God. Yeah. Like God is so other that we don't even have language to contain God. Yeah. Right? So if God has both masculine and feminine qualities, then it serves us to say that there are certain qualities that God has chosen to emulate in women, just like there are certain qualities that God has chosen to emulate in men, yeah. right? Yeah. Take the definition of a mother. One who brings forth life yeah. or the origin or the source mm. of something. Is not God the origin and the source of all creation? Yeah. James 1.18 says that God brings forth in truth. Yeah. Could it be that God chose women to emulate the quality that God has that is bringing forth life in every situation and in the lives of others. That he, he chose women to be the sustainers of truth for generations to come. Could that be? The only person biologically connected to the birth of Christ was Mary. And what did she, who did she birth? She birthed the Christ, yes. the way, the truth, and the life, yeah, yeah. right? Women were the first to proclaim, were some of the first to proclaim the resurrection. And what is that a message of? A message of what? Life conquering death. Yeah. A message of truth and of hope. Have you ever noticed how it's the women in your life always pushing you a little further to reach your potential? Yeah. It's so always the women say, no, no, just give him one more chance. Just give him one more chance. He can get it right. He can get it right. Don't be so Just Right? Maybe not all women. Most. Right? Because there is this innate quality and essence that God has created within women that is this mothering quality. And when I say mothering, I don't mean necessarily birthing a physical child, but this this birthing or this nurturing of life in every situation. That in the midst of death, we have to find ways to bring life back. Yeah. Right? So in this way, women, you are mothers, regardless of whether or not you have biologically had a child. All right? So the first point is that this woman was deemed the mother of his child, not because of biology or because of truth, but because of her response, her love. Yeah. The second point is that this whole situation between these two women is indicative of broken uh, family and community. Mm -hmm. Now there are many definitions of, of family and we'll use just a very basic one. So one of the more basic definitions of family is um, those who live under the same roof, right? And we know that there's a certain intimacy that comes with living in a space with folk, even if you don't like folk, yeah. right? or even if these are people you wouldn't normally, right, live with, there's something about living with people, right, that makes, that creates an intimacy. Now this woman, the first woman, when she was telling the story, she says, we live in the same house, not we share the same home, right? So clearly there was, there was some schisms going on between these two women, despite the fact that they had a whole lot in common. What do we know that they had in common? They were both prostitutes, which means that they likely didn't have a male figure of their family to help support them and protect them, so they were disconnected from their biological family. They both conceived around the same time. They both had sons, and they were gonna be single mothers, because what man would step up to, 
to claim the child of a prostitute, right? And fifth, they also had a comment that their sons were going to be raised under the stigma of their birth. So these women had a lot of things in common at their core, but there was a break yeah. in their connection. Yeah. Now we talk a lot about community here. We talk a lot about being connected, right? But this thing runs deep, right? Archbishop Desmond Tutu talks about this um, understanding. He said it's even hard to render into Western language. This understanding of what it means to be in community is called Ubuntu. Right? And he says someone who has Ubuntu is someone who understands that they are caught up, that they are inextricably bound up in the humanity of others. Mm -hmm. That means that they make themselves open and available. They affirm others. It means that they are not threatened when others are good yeah. or are able. It means that they understand that their humanity is diminished when other people's humanity is diminished or humiliated or oppressed. Mm -hmm. This connection runs deep. Beyond the ways that it just affects us every day, you know, everything we do affects somebody else. Yes. Right? Yes. I sit at the stoplight, I move up a little bit, the car behind me moves up a little bit. <laughs> the car behind him moves up a little bit, right? So that's just every day, right? But when we were growing up, right, and actually Dana and I can attest to this, when we were growing up, you know, we used to hear our mothers always talk about if you got enough women spending enough time together, right, whether they live together or they work together, eventually their monthly cycle would align, right? People have actually studied this, and it's true. What does this mean? It means that even if we ignore the connection that God has given us, mentally and spiritually, our bodies still respond to it automatically. All right, all right, yeah. right? There is something about this connection. Yeah. And sisters, sometimes we have a difficulty with our own sense of self and worth and value and beauty. Right? We have a difficulty with our own insecurities in such a way that we automatically put our own stuff onto other women. Yeah, that's right. right? No, she stuck up. Right? Right? But really, it's us. We don't know anything about that sister. Nothing about it. Right? But everything is going on in us. But what I'm saying is this closes us off. What we see in the dynamics between these two women is that this whole situation could have been very different. Right? And they had that connection. A girlfriend of mine went to seminary and brilliant sister, and she said, you know, there was this girl. She's like, you know, we were there together. She's like, but there was always tension between us, and I don't know. We never talked or anything. It was just tension. She said, so, you know, one day I had the opportunity to share my story. She said um, she was raped when she was a teenager. She shared publicly her story, and this girl comes up to her, and she's like, you know, I, you know, I know, you know that we've had our our differences and there's been some tension. She said, but you sharing your story today really resonated with me. She said, because I was molested as a child and I could really attest to everything you were saying. And she said, the kind of friendship that grew out of it, like she considers this girl her sister now. They live together, they stay connected, they pray together, they cry together, they laugh together, they have really dug deep together. But how much would they have missed in that blessing had one not had the courage to say, I see a connection. You see, these two women were disconnected. And after all the stuff that they had to go through in their life, they had a hard life, y'all. After all the stuff that they had to go through in their life, how much better it would have been to have been able to come home to a family rather than just live in a house with some other people. So this broken family and community is the second point. And were it not for that broken community, there may not be a need for the third point. Which brings us back to the first question that was asked. Whose child is this? Whose cold, dead, lifeless baby is back at the house while we sitting here in front of the king trying to rectify the fate of the one that's still living? Whose son is back at that house? Who's going to cry for him? Who's going to grieve for him? Where is justice for him, King Solomon? No one has seemed to even lift their breath to consider 
how his life was taken into account. Does he not matter because he was the dead offspring of a prostitute? Does he not matter because he only lived outside of his mother's womb for a few hours or days at most? Who will cry and grieve for the dead child? Y'all, we walking by the walking bed every day. Children who are living and breathing but are dead inside. Every woman in this building has a God-given, created mandate to be a mother. And our children are dead. I remember sitting in a Wednesday Bible study when I was a youth pastor. There were um, a lot of kids who would come from the, from the community, and this one boy, he came in, and I, I mean, he just gripped me, gripped my heart, because he was so stoic, you know? No emotion, his eyes were just kind of flat, you know? He was really disconnected, and so he came in, and he put his earphones in, and so I tapped him, I said, we're not going to be able to sit here with your earphones, right? And I think it's so ironic how we go so long without what we need that when we finally encounter it, we don't recognize it. Right? And so he takes his earphones out and then he pro hit, uh, proceeds to just go to sleep through the lesson. Waiting for the food. So we fed him. Right? So we knew a lot of kids ain't for food. It's all good. So after, you know, the lesson was over, I just couldn't let it go. Like something about this boy said, I just gotta, I just gotta know that there's something inside. Right? And so I tried to engage him and I started talking to him. I asked him what his name was, you know. Where did he go to school? You know, he gave me one word answers. You know, it wasn't like he was frustrated with me. He just did not show any emotion. And finally, I said, well, what are you interested in? What do you do in your spare time? He said, oh, I play ball. I said, oh, you play ball. I said, you like to play ball? He said, yeah, that's why I play ball. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. I said, well, you know, is that something you think you want to do long term? He's like, sure. He's like, yeah. I, you know, I said, so maybe in college? He's like, yeah. I said, well, how are your grades? He said, oh, my grades are good. I said, well, you know your grades have to be acceptable if you're going to go to college and play ball. You know, period. And I said, but you know what? If I was a betting woman, I said, I would bet that if you work hard enough, that you could probably make the honor roll if you wanted to. And immediately something in him broke. You know, and he was like, oh man, right? He smiled, but even though he turns his face away, I got something, right? There was some emotion there. There's something inside, yeah. right? But think about how many people had encountered him, how many teachers had encountered him, and faced with so many other kids that they're trying to deal with, didn't have the time to just dig, yeah. right? And even me, that was one occurrence. I don't know this boy's mom. I don't know how she loves him. I don't know how many jobs she has to work. All I know is that it takes more than one prayer, more than one act of love, more than one mother to save a child. No mother can be with their child every moment of every day. So all we can do is pray that there are other women out there somewhere, counselors, friends, aunties, right? People willing to claim our children as their own, to correct them and love them when we are all of us must start mothering our children. Mm, yeah. So the question that is posed to us today isn't whether or not the living child is yours and the dead child is mine. The answer is that they both belong to us all. Yeah. Whose child is this? He's mine. Yeah. Yeah. He's yours. Yeah. And every day, we are encountering people and situations that require us to be able to speak life in the midst of death. Sisters, you do it every day without knowing it, right? Even some of you who can't articulate it, you're constantly saying, but there has to be a better way. There has to be something better than this. God, I want something better than this. God, I want to feel different. Right? It's already in you. It's already in you. So this is what we're going to do. I want the women, where you are, to just take a moment. I want you to close your eyes, and I just want you to envision the kids that you know and have seen in your lifetime. 
They may be kids that you've prayed for. They may be adults at this time. They may be your own children. They may be people that you just know. They may be a child that you just passed on the street. But you know that that's a child who needs some more love. Just envision their, envision their face right now. This is your prayer. Just envision their face. This is your prayer to God for that child. Just see their face. See joy on their face. See them living into their potential. See God meeting them where they are. Just take a moment. Now I want all the women to come to the altar. Just make your way to the altar. <coughs> and sisters, after you get here, just continue to connect with God. Brothers, I want you to surround the women after they're here. I was telling 9 a.m. service that Public Enemy sung a song called Secure the First World. And what they were talking about is that women's are, women are the first teacher, teachers of our children. Right? And our children are the power that God has given us to change this world. Yeah. All right? So brothers, just come, come and surround with the sisters. And brothers, you don't have to pray out loud, but I want you praying for the women at this altar. God, I thank you for the women whom you've created and you've made them beautiful and wonderful and strong and powerful. And God, I know that there are women at this altar who are struggling with a lot of pain. And so God, I'm praying now that you continue them on their journey to healing. God, I pray for the women at this altar who's mothers were not present or whose mothers were absent or unable to be who they needed to be. God, I pray for the women at this altar who are still grieving the loss of a child. God, I pray for those who've had miscarriages at this altar. I pray for those who've had abortions at this altar. God, I pray for those who've had children who've died to violence or sickness at this altar. God, I know that that is a whole, almighty God, that only you can feel. So by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name, I pray, God, that you begin to fill that hole with your joy, with your love, and with your faith. God, mend those spaces that they thought were never possible. God, I pray for the women at this altar, God, whose wounds were unable to create children, God, whose wounds were unable to birth biological children, God. I pray that you are reaching deep by the hand of your spirit. That you're healing their mind, Almighty God. Lord, that you are reminding them, God, that you have called them to a greater purpose. And God, that you have placed children around them, God, that they are to pour into and whose lives they are destined to change. God, touch those women. And Lord, I pray for these sisters who say, I don't have it. I don't have a mothering spirit. I'm just, I'm too distant. I'm too cold. And God, I pray now that you begin to just touch their heart and warm it, God, that you begin to touch and soften, God, their spirit, God, that you begin to connect them to the things that they've lost in their life, God, I pray that you begin to connect them to who you are as their mother, God, I thank you in Jesus' name that every woman at this altar, Almighty God, has the power and the capacity to change the lives of people around them, so God, give them the wisdom that they need and the discernment that they need and the anointing that they need the power that they need, Almighty God, the knowledge that they need, Almighty God, to just pour life, God, into the situations and into the people and into the children that they encounter on a daily basis. God, I pray that they will have hope, God, when everybody else is in despair. God, I pray that they will speak healing, God, when everybody else thinks it's over. God, I pray in Jesus' name that they will speak victory, God, when everybody else hangs their head in defeat. God, I thank Will open their eyes that they might not be blind, God. Lord, I thank you that they 